morning art hostage here and we're going to do another episode right this is going to be episode 10 right now it's a good story right it's um about a robbery right and a few robberies that i pre prevented in the mid 2000s now the cast of characters in this one right um are celebrities and well-known people the robbery was Silla Black in 2003, where Doe and the other um, uh, burglar, right, um, where they burgled her house and, and stole a million pounds worth of jewellery. Okay, then the next one, right, is when I prevented the theft of a diamond encrusted sword from the Duke of Northumberland at Annick Castle. That's where they filmed Harry Potter. And then the next one, right, is Harry Potter author jk rowling her house in aberfeldy i prevented that being robbed and then the next one we move down to is um sting you know sting the singer you know walking on the moon and all that game right right sting's house in wiltshire is called lake house right and behind his house he's got great big fields of barley and you remember that song you know what i mean oh, the through the fields of you know not fields of gold and all that game well, he wrote that because he was looking out at the barley. Anyway, Lake House, right, in Wiltshire's Sting's house. I prevented that being robbed, right? Next door to him, right, Madonna, when she was married to Guy Ritchie, she bought an estate, right? And then there was a planned robbery I managed to stop there, right? Another one, Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, who owns all the um, pre-Raphaelites and that, at Sidmington House down in um, Hampshire, right? I prevented a robbery there. Um, oh, Frogmore in Windsor Great Park, Frogmore House, you know, where they've got the mausoleum, right, to Queen Victoria, and I only open it a few days of the year, right, I went up there one of the days, um, one of the days a year with, um, uh, with my um, lawyer, long-time lawyer, Graham White, God rest his soul, got lovely stories about Graham White, you know, when he died in, oh, was it 05, yeah, he was mayor of Hastings, anyway, all that, right, yeah, and Frogmore House, I prevented a robbery there, right, and just shows you all these things, right? So now, right, let's start the sort. Let's have a little drink of water here. Clear the, uh, clear the throat. Right, now, off we go. In 2002, right, the Johnson gang, um, Ricky Johnson, um, Jimmy Johnson, and Danny Boy, and all the little affiliates, right, they're running wild, right, around the country, right, they're robbing everyone, right, all kinds of very prominent people, stately homes, and all this kind of carryings on, right, and the authorities don't know what to do, they can't, um, you know, they can't keep up with them, you know, you know, they can't uh, stop them, okay, and, and now, even 2022, they're still at it, right, and they still can't catch them, right, they caught them, right, and they went off for a little pit stop for a few years, but they're back at it, and been at it, well, anyway, so this is back in 2002, so, Thames Valley Police, right, um, and the National Crime Squad, right, they um, get together, right, and then they um, they want to meet him with me, right, um, uh, to start with, right, um, to start with, it was a National Crime Squad, and, and Dick Ellis arranged the meeting, right, so anyway, I go to the meeting, a National Crime Squad, right, because it's 03 and there's new Ripper rules, um, the Regulate, Regulatory and Investigative Powers Act 2000, and that's when they created the source units, right, where, which, is all anonymous and all bollocks, you know what I mean? And then no one ever wants to sign up for that. That's And when they did that, um, intelligence gathering went down 90%. Well, anyway, this is the National Crime Squad, so they don't play by the rules. Anyway, I met up with a couple of the pe people with Dick Ellis, and they signed me up, right, as a registered informant, 2002. Right, the next thing, right, um, the next thing that happens, okay, is that uh, Thames Valley Police, because it's all going down in their area, Right, they um they um uh they want um they want to sign me up as well, right? So um I then have a meeting, right, and I'm just trying to find the names. It's up here somewhere. I've got them here somewhere. Where are they? It was in one of these articles. Where is it? Right, hang on. Um is it this one? It could be this one. No, hang on. Now, bear with me. Anyway, so Thames Valley Police, right, they then signed me up, okay, um, in, uh, when was it? It was uh, um, 2002, right? Okay, here we go. Yeah, here we go, right? 
It was it was the Thames Valley Force Intelligence Bureau, right? They're based at Oxford Road, Kidlington, right? And I was signed up, right, by DC 3882 Jackie Murdoch, right? Okay. And um, a Sergeant Mick Brown, who was head of the um, Force Intelligence Bureau, and a Sergeant 2806 Richard May, well, he got promoted to inspector, which seems to happen to a lot of police officers I talk to. So anyway, I'm signed up now with the National Crime Squad and the False Intelligence Bureau of Thames Valley Police, right? So anyway, I'll go over and I'll meet, um, right, I, um, I'll meet the National Crime Squad um, in Lewis, right, at a, um, a hotel called Shelley's Hotel in Lewis. Nice hotel. It's um, had out all loads of antiques in it. It was before Hoogstraat and bought it. It was owned by a family or whatever. Nicholas Hoogstraat and the um, um, uh, entrepreneur, right, he bought it. I think he might even still own it, but he's out in Zimbabwe or something like that. He owns like millions of acres out there. But anyway, before Nicholas Hoogstraat and bought it, I go to um, Shelley's Hotel, right? Um, but first time I went to Shelley's Hotel, I go and, um, and I meet. Um, we have dinner, and um, Dick Ellis, right, and Robert Reed, right, who's the head at Hiscox, the insurers, right, he's been there for donkey's years, like 40 years or 30 years, right, he's in charge of all the uh, art, art insurance, right, at Hiscox, right, so anyway, Robert Reed's there, right, and he's looking pasty white, white as a ghost he is, right, the Johnsons are robbing all these stately homes and all these high collectors and, and, and celebrities and that, right, and his cocks are paying out millions, millions, right, keep going, so he's gone, Paul, he said, we've got to do something about this, you know, and so Dick Ellis is there and he's gone, right, he said, I'm going to try and get him signed up with a national crime squad and we can get things up and running, I went, all right, and okay, Robert, all right, okay, Dick, so anyway, next time I meet, I meet Dick Ellis with a National Crime Squad. They sign me up. They're not meant to do that. It should have been actually uh, the Force Intelligence Bureau or whatever. But I suppose the National Crime Squad had their own rules. Anyway, boom. So I'm signed up to them. Next meeting, right, it's up at Gatwick Airport in the um, uh, the Holiday Inn, right, um, and Thames Valley Police Force Intelligence Bureau have hired the, a conference room, right, and at that meeting there was me, um, there was uh, Mark Del Rimple, art loss adjuster from Tyler and Co. There was DC three eight eight two Jackie Murdoch. There was Sergeant Mick Brown. There was Sergeant two eight oh six Richard May. Uh, there of the Thames Valley Force Intelligence Bureau, and we sit in there chatting, and they went, you know, I mean, a lot of these big robberies, Paul, were going down in Thames Valley. You know, he said, and we, um, you know, he said, can you help us with this? I went, well, well yeah, sure, of course I can. I said, but I know you're like source unit and all them silly rules, but what I'll do is I will filter information to the National Crime Squad and then they can debrief you. And then if there's anything in the Thames Valley area, um, they'll they'll let you know and, you know, and then you can um, act on that intelligence. I said, but because of the things I'm do dealing with a national and go all over the UK and even abroad and all that, I'm um, signed up to the... Uh, a national crime squad so you know i'm not like a subcontract then with thames valley he went all right okay he said but well, what's the state of play at the moment i said well the state of the play at the moment the johnsons are running wild as we know i said but apparently there's some other little heavy firm from liverpool right a couple of scousers burglars one's name's doe d-o-e right i can't remember the other name right and at the time i think i only knew doe Right, he's a Liverpool scouser. I said, they're targeting addresses. I said, one of the addresses that they got, or one of the targets, right, is Silla Black. You know, Silla Black, you know, um, surprise, surprise, and all that game, right? You know, um, I said, she is being targeted at a Buckinghamshire house, right, because she's got a big parcel of jewellery that she's gone public, or over the years she's been in sh uh, publicity shots showing all these lovely diamonds, saying that her husband Bobby bought her all this stuff, and she's got a million pounds worth of jewellery and all that, and now she's being targeted. So they're writing it all down, right, and there's a brief uh, suitcase, brief a briefcase there, right, that's open, and I think there's something in there recording it, so I think, so there might still be the recording of that original meeting, right, with the Thames Valley Force Intelligence Bureau, Jackie Murdoch, Mick Brown, Richard May, and Mark Dalrymple, right, in the conference room at the Holiday in Gatwick, right, so anyway, I'm telling her about this, and I'm saying, I'm telling her about these um, two burglars called Doe, and I've got his, I've got his name on archives anyway, 
So boom, anyway, they take that on board, right? We leave, so I'm now signed up as a registered informant. This is 2002, right? Registered informant with uh, National Crime Squad, a registered informant with um, subcontracted with Thames Valley Force Intelligence Bureau, right? And so off we go anyway, boom. A period of time goes and we move into 2003 and then bang, it fucking hits the headlines, right? Now let me read you the article. Where is it here, right? So now you've got to remember, I've given this intelligence to False Intelligence Bureau, okay, right? Now, where are we? <coughs> um, now, is it this one? Let's go up. Let's see. No, this is this is a later one, because Cilla Black was it twice. She was it once. Oh, here it is, right? Here it is on the BBC, right? Monday. Here, let me pull the chair up, because this is uh, quite a good one. Now, Monday... 18th of August 2003, the headline is Scylla devastated by £1 million robbery. An armed gang stole more than £1 million in valuables from entertainer Scylla Black after breaking into her home and threatening to kill her son. The blind date presenter said she was totally appalled and devastated by the attack which saw her lose irreplaceable jewellery given to her by her mother and late husband. In a statement, Miss Black said the loss of her possessions was nothing compared to the ordeal faced by the youngest of her three sons, 22-year-old Jack. She said, I am just so grateful he is alive and slowly coming to terms with what has happened. The gang of three masked men broke into the blind date presenter's home in Denham, Buckinghamshire, about midnight on Saturday. Right, so that that would have been what? So Monday, August the 18th, um, 17th, would have been um, Saturday, 16th of August, 2003. Now, you've got to remember, I warned Thames Valley Force Intelligence Bureau that, that Cilla Black was being a target, right, in 2002, months before this, right? I said, so you've got to be, you know, anyway, so boom, right? The gang of three, um, right, Jack, um, Jack Black, Okay, that's his son's name. Jack, Jack, who was watching the television, her banging on his bedroom door and opened it, expecting to see his 29-year-old brother. He was then hit with a crowbar and bundled to the floor, the statement, said, the statement said. The gang handcuffed Jack and put a hunting knife to his throat, right, saying that they would kill him unless he showed them where the valuables were. After finding what they wanted, the gang then threatened to put him in the boot of their car and kidnap him. Jack had the presence of minds to reason with them, and thankfully they decided instead to secure him to a radiator in the house. The star arrived home on Monday afternoon after cutting short a holiday. She said, our Jack, right, I suppose, yeah, our, our Jack has been a very brave man, and I'm extremely proud at the way he handled and um, he handled and is handling this traumatic experience. What he was subjected to must be everyone's nightmare. It is thought the cash, gold, and Miss Black's entire jewellery collection was stolen during the raid, including her mother's engagement rings, wedding rings, and presents from her, her husband, Bobby Willis. She said, losing my, my, entire, losing my entire collection of all the gifts Bobby, Bobby gave me and my ma mam's, and my mam's wedding and engagement rings is heartbreaking. Their sentimental value outweighs their material worth. Now I've lost everything, I will not be replacing them. You can't replace sentimental value and it's not worth putting anyone's life at risk. Miss Black, whose other son, a 33-year-old 33 33 Robert, added, burglary is not just a violation of your home, but also a ter terrible psychological crime, as anyone who's experienced it will know. Right? Uh, sadly, it's becoming more and more common these days. Yeah, well, tell me about it. it was, you know, when I was trying to tell the police. Oh, here we go. A, Stokes, a spokesman for Thames Valley Police confirmed three men had forced their way into the into the house past a male resident. They hit the man what was believed to be a crowbar and restrained and restrained him. The man did not require hospital treatment but was left shaken by the incident. Nobody has yet been arrested in connection with the burglary. A police helicopter and dogs were used to search for the men, but they could not be found. Really. So really, the, so the alarm went up, right? The screen went up, right? About by hours and hours later, and then the police put the helicopter up and the dogs were like, were like as if they, they're not gone. Anyway, the burglars on that was a skeptic scouser, Doe, another guy, I can't, I'll get his name, right? I've got his name, right? And obviously someone else, right? So anyway, bang, right now, Thames Valley, right now the shit's hit the fan, you can imagine internally, 
It's like you, we've had intelligence on Scylla Black and we ain't warned her. Oh, for fuck's sake, what are we doing? I mean, when I told them back in 2002, right, at the Holiday Inn in Gatwick, right, Jackie Murdoch, right, Mick Brown and Richard May, right, and I said, Scylla Black's being targeted. Jackie May went out, oh, Jackie Murdoch went, oh, Paul, don't start all that, right, laughing. This is at the time, right, months before Scylla's hit, right? It wouldn't have been difficult for Thames Valley Police to speak to Scylla Black and her family and say, look, you're being targeted, so all your jewellery you've got, if I was you, I'd put it all in the bank and leave it there for a couple of years, right? And when you want to use it, get one or two bits out, but you're being targeted and we can even, we, you know, you could even do publicity to say Scylla Black thinks her jewellery's too valuable, valuable, it's now in the bank and that might put the burglars off, right? But no, they didn't do fuck all, right? Didn't, didn't warn Scylla. Right, and Scylla gets robbed of like a million pounds worth of jewellery. Right, this is in the August, right? Now, to make things worse, right, so internally, right, um, so internally, Thames Valley Police, there's all kinds of shit at the fan and they're not happy about all this game, right? So then, right, this is August, and then, right, this is now, now, two months later, right, in 24th of, August, of October 2003, two months after being robbed, Scylla Black, 24th of, of October, 24th of October, 2003, right, Scylla Black, right, um, gets the claim for her insurance turned down, right, they blank her, right, they say, no, no, we're not going to pay out, right, they refuse to pay out, and it's in This Is Money, which is, I think is a Daily Mail financial thing, right, you can just search it online, the article's called Scylla Black, £1 million insurance blow, Right, it's from the 24th of October 2003. Uh, I'll read it to you, right? Scylla Black's £1 million insurance claim for jewellery stolen in a violent raid on her home has been turned down. It was revealed today. Her insurers have refused to pay because there were no locks on the downstairs windows, making her policy null and void. Three masked burglars entered the £2 million home in Denham through a window. They beat Miss, Miss Black's youngest son, Jack, with a crowbar, held a knife to his throat and threatened to kill him, forcing, forcing him to reveal where the safe was. Right, the men took Miss, Miss, Miss Black's entire jewellery collection, including a diamond pendant worth tens of thousands of pounds and sentimental gifts of Bobby, who died of cancer in 1999. Her mother's engagement ring, wedding rings were also lost. A source told the son, Scylla had been told she won't receive a penny. She did have household insurance, but the claim has been rejected. The problem is locks were not fitted to her downstairs window, as Scylla had stipulated. A source from the in insurance industry said the policy would state that downstairs windows must have locks, and locked at all times. It will also state there must be an alarm system which must be on at all times when the premises are left vacant. There is no room for leniency or manoeuvre on these types of policies where the contents run into tens of thousands or millions of pounds. Yeah, do you know what I mean? The, the insurance company will wriggle out there, try and do anything. You know what I mean? They move heaven and earth, right, not to pay out on a claim, right? Anyway, security is tight at the house with raw iron gates and a seven-foot-high fences around thick edges, with, uh, behind thick hedges. There are also motion-sensitive lights and closed-circuit television cameras. Miss Black has taken a year off from TV presenting to recover from the shot of the burglary on 16th of August. She had been on holiday in Spain when she was called by Jack to tell her they'd been robbed. During the raid, the men said they would kidnap Jack, kidnap Jack and hold him to ransom, but he talked them out of the plan. They escaped after ch chaining him to a radiator, Miss Black said at the time. Obviously, the jewellery does not compare with Jack, what Jack has had to endure. Losing my entire collection of the gifts Bobby gave me and my mum's wedding ring, the sentimental value right far outweighs the material worth. Now I've lost everything, I won't replace it, right? Now it says the Denham home has got tennis courts and she also owns a £1 million penthouse in London and a £400,000 apartment in Barbados. Right, and then it says insurers normally require homeowners to fit five lever mortise deadlocks to front and back doors. Yeah, well, I've got three on each. I have locks fitted on every ground floor window. Yep, yeah, got that done. Install burglar alarms and service regularly. Yeah, got that. If the alarms are fitted or if the policyholder installs lock above a certain standard required, some insurance companies will offer policyholders a discount of up to five or ten percent. Unbelievable, right? So poor old Scylla, right? Now, the police, Thames Valley Force Intelligence Bureau, right, they had intelligence from me in 2002, 
right, that Silla Black was being targeted, right, by a Scouse burglar called um, Doe, right, and he's a couple of uppos who are new on the scene, right, um, not working directly in, in conjunction with the Johnson gang, right? They didn't bother to go and, in five minutes, how long does it take to go and tell Scylla, put all your jewellery in the bank, right, and you'll be safe. But no, they don't do that. Scylla gets robbed in the August, right? Two months later, in October, the insurance company go, no, we're not paying you out a million pound or two million pound, whatever it was, because you didn't have locks on the downstairs windows, right? Now, the insurance company and the police very close together and all of a sudden, right, does the insurance company talk to the police, Robert Reed, right, talk to the uh, to the police and find out that they fucking knew, right, um, and it's the police's fault, right, and then all of a sudden the police say, yeah, well, you can get out of it if you uh, say she didn't have the locks on the window. Do you know what I mean? Wrong, isn't it, eh? Right, so anyway, that's that, right? So now, let's go, right, this is 2000, and, right, so we move now, and this is 2000, and we move into 2003, uh, uh, right? So now, right, um, I then, right, one of the meetings I have with the um, um, Thames Valley Force Intelligence Bureau, right, Mick Brown and um, Richard May, because by this time, Jackie Murdoch used to be in charge of the Thames Valley Art and Antique Squad, Right, but um, because Mick Brown and Richard May, who became a detective inspector, right, and I've got stories about him, right, anyway, because they were in the force, they were in the source unit, right, Jackie Murdoch sort of went, took a back step. I used to still speak to her and Jim as well, old Jim, Jim Hill, right, um, you know what I mean, when he retired, and he knew all about this, right, old oh, Jim Hill was at the fucking meeting. Right, when I first was introduced to the Thames Valley Force Intelligence Bureau, at that meeting there was uh, Mark Dalrymple, Jim Hill, Jackie Murdoch, uh, Mick Brown, Richard May and myself. Right, and then so Jim, Jim Hill was there when I told him about Scylla. When it goes to 03, right, and Scylla Black gets robbed, Jim Hill goes potty, he's fucking freaking right out. He's not happy at all. Fucking hell, he's like, Paul, you told him. Anyway, and then when Scylla don't get paid out on her money, uh, on her claim with Jim Hill's freak, Jim Hill's freaking, and then Jim Hill is that by that time he's retired, and Thames Valley Police start threatening Jim Hill, saying if you start going public with all this and all that game. So anyway, what happens right is Jim Hill contacts a Daily Mirror reporter called um, Jeff Edwards, right, and there was an article in the Daily Mirror. Right, saying that Thames Valley Police knew this and then they denied it in the mirror and it was all kinds of shit at the fan. I'll, I'll dig the article out and I'll read it to you. So anyway, right, so that's the Silla Black thing, right? Now this Doe, right, and, I walk, right, and the other two geezers, right, um, uh, right, they then go on after Silla Black to make do other armed robberies, right, and they do another robbery of a woman, right, in, um, 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 I think it was in, uh, in Thames Valley area, they tied her up, arm robbery, and they got away with another £400,000 worth of jewellery, but they left behind some forensics, right? And then, right, so so the police, knowing about Doe and that, he does seal a black. They still don't get on to him 24-7. They do three or four other robberies, including one for £400,000 worth of jewellery and cash and all that. And they leave some forensics there, so then police finally arrest them Right, charge them just with that one. They haven't got enough to charge them with Scylla Black's one, right? But they know they did it, right? Anyway, they get convicted and they get weighed off and then they go to jail. Right, well, in 2003, right, I get information, right, that comes through, right, that, these, uh, there, that there's some country house burglars, thieves, right, have targeted, right, Annick Castle, Annick Castle, right, the home of the Duke of Northumberland. Right, it's where they filmed Harry Potter movies, you know, and all that stuff, you know, when they fly around and all that and the castle scenes. That's Annick Castle, right? Now, in Annick Castle, they've got an incredible art collection. They've got a pair of of um, cabinets that come from Louis XIV or Louis XV, right? Um, superb pair, millions they'd be worth. They've got the artworks, the, like the silver they got in there is like unreal, silver gilt, right? There's like a lot of it's Paul Store. Not Paul Delamery, 18th century, but Paul Store, 19th century. Beautiful, right? Lovely, right? But also, in amongst the Duke of Northumberland's art collection, right, they've got this um, this sword, and the whole handle, the whole handle, right, is diamonds encrusted, right? Made all the diamonds. All you can see is diamonds, right? Hundreds of diamonds, loads of them, right? Right? 
diamond encrusted sword and it's displayed in this really flimsy little glass case right that you know that very thin glass right and it's displayed in one of the hallways when you walk through the um um Annick castle on the tour right it's open to the public you go round the corner and then there it is as you go down like this corridor right so it's like a tucked in out of the way Right, so I now get intelligence that right that the, the country house burglars are targeting this sword because even if they just smash it up and break it up, there's about a hundred thousand pounds or two hundred thousand pounds worth of diamonds in it, right? If it was sold legitimately with its history, because it had been given to the Duke of Northumberland by one of his ancestors, right? Diamond encrusted sword. It'd make millions, right? But even if you smashed it all up, it'd come to a few hundred thousand, and then the stones would be recut, and then they could be sold off. Remember the uh, markup, so over a million. So anyway, it's being targeted. So anyway, I'll get the, Im <clears throat> I'll get the information. Cut Let me have a little drink of water. I drop my teas when I speak sometimes, when I'm, because um, it's my natural, um, the way I speak, all right? I, you know, water, butter. And all that came right anyway. Um, so I get the information through, right, um, via Mark Del Rimple, right, and Thames Valley Force, and uh, via Mark Del Rimple, sorry, at the um, loss adjuster, right. He then contacts, right, the Duke of Northumberland, goes up there and sees him and said, Your Grace, look, um, and he goes and he says, Look, see this diamond encrusted sword here, right? Um, um, our top informant says that this is being targeted. Right, by some um, heavy duty country house burglars. Right, and our informant says the best thing you can do is take this out and put it in the bank, right, for a period of time until we know that the coast is clear. And in fact, actually, you should actually get the case uh, reinforced with reinforced glass and that, because that, I mean, you wouldn't even need a hammer. Do you know what I mean? It was very, very thin glass. You, you know, it'd take 10 seconds to steal it. So he said, oh, thank you very much, right, the Duke of Northumberland. So anyway, they have the, sword, the diamond encrusted sword taken out and they have it put in the bank. Within a, right, Mark Dalrymple comes back, rings me up, you know, and he used to call me Turbo, right, Mark Dalrymple. Oh, hello, Turbo. He went, yes, just spoke to uh, his grace, the Duke of Northumberland, and he's put the um, diamond encrusted sword in the bank. He said, well done. I went, okay. So boom, phone goes down. Within a week, week later, I'll get a phone call from Mark Dalrymple. Turbo, he said, you are the absolute bee's knees. He said, um, the other day, he said that they are observing the two country house burglars that you said, they've paid their ticket price and they're going on the tour through um, Annick Castle. And when they get to the, the case where the diamond sword is, now in the meantime, what they've done is they turned the cameras around so they got cameras on this empty case where the... Uh, the diamond sword was. So anyway, the two burglars are on the um, a tour and they get to where the diamond sword is and they get them on camera, right? And they look at each other as if to say, oh shit, it's not now, right? So they would have stole it there and then. So anyway, boom, they leave Annick Castle and then they drive off and then the police get on them 24 seven, right? Okay, right? So now <clears throat> I've prevented the diamond encrusted sword from Annick Castle being stolen because it's in the bank. The two burglars come in, they catch them on camera because I told them to put the cameras on it, right? They then leave the burglars and then the police mount an operation and actually start watching these two country house burglars, right, 24-7. Um, a week later, or a period of time after that, after Annick Castle, they observe these two burglars, okay, Right, um, blacking themselves up with all that gear, you know, and the, and the um, balaclavas with the eyes cut out and all that, and dark clothing, right? Right, and they go to Lake House, right, down in w Wiltshire, which is owned by the singer, right, Sting. You know, um, you know, walking on the moon and all that game, right? Sting owns it, lives there with his wife, Trudy, right, and their kids, which I think might have been grown up. It's called Lake House, right? in Wiltshire, right, and, um, right, beautiful, big, huge mansion, right, now, um, Sting, right, has, um, um, has purchased over the years off of a London dealer called Christopher Hodsall, Hodsall, right, over six million pounds worth of antiques and paintings and all that game, right, in his hallway, right, it's a fucking great hallway, he's got one of the biggest carpets, right, you'd ever see in your life, it's about 30 foot, 40 foot long and about 30 foot wide, 
right? Great big huge carpet, right? And its house is full of antiques. Over six million he's paid retail. So there's probably about trade, I don't know, 1.5, say, in trade, and then stolen. If you sold them telling the people they were stolen, you'd probably get £150,000. But for a night's work for two burglars, right, they you know, £100,000, right? So forget they're worth six million retail. So anyway, the police observe these two burglars from Annick Castle who, who failed to steal the diamond-encrusted sword in the bushes, right, at Lake House, taking photographs, looking and all this sort of carry-on, right? And then they go off, right? And so all of a sudden the police know that Sting is going to be targeted, right, for a, a, a big robbery. Now, at the time, right, police, right, then, right, do go and see Sting, and they say, listen, um, uh, we've got intelligence that, you know, you're being targeted and all that. And Sting, you can imagine, he's fucking freaked out. He don't reckon this. And Trudy's going, oh, what the fuck are we going to do? Right. So anyway, Sting then, right, then arranges to go on a tour for 18 months. And so him, Trudy and the kids and all that. Anyway, they fuck off, right? So that lake house now is empty, just got staff in it. Right, and then the police go uh, um, station themselves in there, hoping that the burglars might have a pop at it, right? And then all of a sudden, they're still on the burglars, right? Right, and um, and then something happens that makes the police swoop on them and arrest them, right? So they arrest them. Maybe they did something else before they did um, stings, right? Or they done something. Anyway, the police had to swoop on them, arrest them. Don't charge them with... Um, I think initially they were going to charge them with um, conspiracy uh, to burgle sting, at Lake House or something, but they didn't have a, you know, they they observed them in the bushes and all that, and they had surveillance and everything, right? But I don't think Sting was too happy to give, like, go public with all this carry on. So they didn't charge them with that, but I think they might have charged them with some other stuff and that, right? And then they got weighed off, right? So anyway, there's another one, right? So I stopped Sting being um, um, robbed of his £6 million worth of antiques that he bought off of Christopher Hodsall. Now, how Sting became a target was that Christopher Hodsall, right, had a manager of his shop, right, called Cadogan. Now, Cadogan, right, got in with someone from the Johnson gang, right, one of the dealers they used to sell with, right, and he, and he stuck Sting up as a target, saying, my boss, Christopher Hodsall, has sold him uh, £6 million worth of antiques. I'll give you a list of what they are and the, and the value of them, right? And then they got passed right, to these two country house burglars, right, as a potential target. Right. Now, the next thing that happens, right, um, in the meantime, right, um, Guy Ritchie is married Madonna, and they're close friends with Sting and Trudy and all that, and they buy an, an estate, right, next door to Sting's Lake House estate in Wiltshire. I think he's probably still got it. They still go shooting there. Anyway, so Guy Ritchie and Madonna have bought this estate right next to them, deep in the woods, fucking miles from everywhere, right? Great big house. Now, at that time, right, um, there was a painting that came up in New York or came up in London. It was Madonna or something. I can't remember what it was, whether it was by Edmund Munk or whoever it was by anyway. It made like one and a half million pound or something or two million, three million dollars. And it was said that Madonna had bought it because it was called Madonna or something, right? Anyway, she bought this painting and she'd installed it in the house in Wiltshire next door to Sting and Trudy, right? And that where she lived with Guy Ritchie. So now it's hanging on the wall there. So then all of a sudden, right, that address of Madonna and Guy Ritchie were, were then given right, out by one of the staff had told someone anyway in the pub or whatever it happened, right? So then they were now a target for this two, three million dollar painting that Madonna had bought at auction, right, at the house down in Wiltshire that she lived with at the time, Guy Ritchie. So anyway, I'll pass the information through, right, Mark Del Rimple, he passes it on, right, they go and tell, right, and so they didn't go and see Guy Ritchie and, and Madonna, right, and then apparently Madonna moved the painting from the Wiltshire country house to her place in New York, and I, I suppose it still hangs on the wall there now. So that's how I prevented Madonna and Guy Ritchie, right, having their house next door to Sting being burgled, right, and losing, right, not only that Madonna painting, whether they had any other art and antiques in there, they'd have gone and all, do you know what I mean? They'd have cleared them out. I mean, apparently the house is fucking miles from anywhere. So they'd have just gone there on the weekend and just fucking, with a great big van or removal lorry, and just fucking cleared the place, do you know what I mean? So anyway, I've prevented that for Guy Ritchie and Madonna. 
right? And apparently when they divorced or something, Guy Ritchie got this estate and I think he's still got it and he goes there shooting and all that game. Well, if you're listening, Guy, do you know what I mean? Just make sure all the locks are double locked. But I'm talking about back in 03, 2003 or two or four or whenever it was. So anyway, he's sorted, right? Now that's that done, right? Okay, now the next intelligence I'll get, right, is that Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, right, he owns Sidmington House, okay, right, um, that the that, that, that he's a target, right, because they're gonna they're gonna drive a Jeep backwards into his French windows, right, straight in, and they're gonna nick his pre-Raphaelite paintings and particularly this Richard Dad painting that he bought in 1985 for a million pound it's a circular painting of like butterflies and still life and all that and it sits under the stairs in Andrew Lloyd Webber's house in Sidming it's called Sidmington house in Hampshire right and and there's a little table by it with a great big right uh, powerful magnifying glass and you look for the magnifying glass to show the detail it's by Richard Dad now I'll, I'll do an episode on him Richard Dad was the um uh, artist, right, who was in Bedlam because he'd gone crazy, but he'd done some unreal stuff, and there was a painting by him discovered on the roadshow back in 86 uh, that the British Museum stole off the owners, right? They gave him £100,000 for it. It was worth a million, two million, right? Andrew Lloyd Webber had bought a still life which was less va uh, valuable than the one that was found on the antique roadshow, right? But they, the old couple that had it, right, that they were pressured so much, the British Museum gave them £100,000 for it. It would have made £2 million at the time. Do you know what I mean? They cheated them. So, you know what I mean? The British Museum, and it's still there now, right? Millions it's worth. It's um called... Uh, Something resting in the desert. It's a desert scene at night, right? With um, with like figures with top hats on round a round a fire and a couple of Arabs and a few camels and all that, right? The atmospherics and all that. Richard Dad, yeah. Anyway, so boom. Anyway, the gang's going to um attack Andrew Lloyd Webber, right? Now he's planning to um um exhibit his his collection, right? Or whether it's gone there, it's coming back. Well, anyway, so the intelligence goes through to Andrew Lloyd Webber, and what I said is what he's got to do is he's got to put then big concrete blocks that they use at Downing Street, you know, anti-terrorist devices, right, on his patio in front of all of his French windows, and then he can put plant pots and flowers around them, and if they try and reverse a Jeep into the French windows, they're going to hit these concrete blocks and they ain't going anywhere. So in, anyway, the, the message gets back to Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, and he has all these things installed, right, and then he don't get it, right? Now, this was about the same time when, Right, the Johnsons, right, it, Harry Hyams. Now, Harry Hyams was a very um, wealthy property tycoon and he lived at a Molesbury Manor in um, Wiltshire and had a, a huge art collection. The Johnsons drove over the fields in the four by fours, reversed through the French windows and took away about 300 pieces, right, of very valuable antiques. There was a clock by Tompion worth a million. There was some paintings and all this kind of stuff and loads of Harry Hyams gear. And I've got a story about that. So they, committed the robbery at Harry Iams, which was they intended to do at Andrew Lloyd Webber's, but were prevented because of the concrete things that are done, right? Yeah, so, so you're thinking, right, lovely. So now, right, all these things are happening, right? And then and then I'm working for, with um, Mark Dalrymple at Tyler & Co., right, who's a loss adjuster, and has got the ear of Robert Reed at Iscox and that, right? And I'm preventing all these. So then I go to Mark Dalrymple, I go, Mark. I said, how much do I get for any of this then? He went, um... Well, um, um, nothing then. He said, because nothing's been stolen. I went, fuck, you know, all this work I'm doing prevented all these things and I'm not getting a shilling. I said, you get paid. I said, you're getting paid by the insurance company, especially with all these, and plus what, what you're getting on the side in the backhanders. I'm getting nothing. Right, then um, I went, then went to uh, Thames Valley and met with um, Richard May and Mick Brown up again at um, Gatwick Airport, right, and I went... Um, I said, right, how much am I getting for this then, right? I said, I've, um, um, I told you about Scylla Black, right? And you didn't fucking go and protect her. She got robbed. A million pounds worth of jewellery. Then she got blanked. She got a no back from the insurance company. They uh, negated her claim. So she's, she's lost. You've recovered nothing, right? I've, um, uh, I've stopped, Harry, um, I've, I've stopped, um, the Harry Potter sword being stolen. I said, Frogmore, I've stopped. I said, Sting, I said, we got Guy Ritchie and Madonna, we got um, Andrew Lloyd Webber, I said, I've stopped all those things happening, right, and they've taken security um, um, precautions and that, I said, so how much have I got, right, so 
Um, Mick Brown and Richard May look at me and they go, um, yes, for all of that, you've got £300. Right? I looked at them right, and I went, yeah, really? I said, let me just tell you what you can do with that 300 quid. You can shove that up your ass, right? And it was at the time, I think, The Apprentice or something, right? Um, 2003, and I might have done, I can't remember if I did, but I said to him, you're fired. You know what I mean? You're, fuck you, that's you. See you later, right? Right, and that was the last fucking meeting I had with um, Thames Valley Force Intelligence Bureau, and that was in 2003. Okay, so that's how they shafted me. Right, and I've got plenty of, of other stories to come. Right, and I can tell you all about them. I've got all the officers' names and everything, right? So now those are a few stories of how I, how I was one a one man, right, stopping all these big art burglaries going on, right, and got nothing for it, okay? Right, so now, um, you know, that's what I was saying. You know, that's, uh, um, you know, a story, a true story with all the people and all them famous people's stuff that are prevented getting stolen, right? I got nothing out of it. Well, 300 quid they offered me and I went, shove it up your ass. 300 quid. Right? And since then, right, I've done nothing. And then the next part of the story comes, right, where all of a sudden, right, I then go the other way, right? Instead of trying to help them and, and preventing art crime and all that carry on, right, I then personally undermine all the art detectives whenever they're trying to make any recoveries, right? Bang, I'm there. The people come to me, I go, no, it's a setup. He's getting paid 20%. You ain't going to get fuck all and you're going to get nicked the minute you produce that thing. I go, boom, right? Hundreds and hundreds of times they were trying to recover stuff, right? And hundreds of times, right, I just fucking put, I just told the people when they come to me, you ain't getting nothing out of this, right? And, right? and also the fact is, is, is as with regards to informants, Right, um, you know, I can honestly say that at least a hundred people have come to me, right, and said that they wanted to be an informant, and I've told them exactly how the source unit works, and none of them, right, signed up to be an informant, and it was getting to a, such a stage where no stolen art was being recovered, nothing was being recovered, they were getting no informants signing up with them, they kept telling them to fuck off, right, and they kept saying, yeah, we spoke to Paul Hendry, and he's told us exactly how it works, right, now all of a sudden we get to 2008, Right, and something's got to be done about me. I'm a one-man wrecking ball, right? And then what happened was the authorities conspired, right, to take me to court on an absurd, stupid benefits um, fraud trial, right? They issued a D notice, right, and I was jailed, right? And then that's something that we're going to get into, right, in another episode. But what we're going to do, this is 42 minutes, so we call this a three-quarter uh, podcast, episode 10, fireside chat, right? And we're going to call this um, celebrity, celebrity um, powerful people, right? Saved from being robbed by art hostage, okay? And it's episode ten, and I'll speak to you soon. This is Art Hostage signing off. <laughs>